All right, I guess we can start this. Uh, welcome to this week's ESRG seminar series. And uh, it's my pleasure to introduce James Kilgannon uh, from the University of Edinburgh. And uh, how did I get to know James? Uh, one thing the slogan that Glasgow has is uh, uh, people make Glasgow. He is one of those people. And uh, um, we met when I started to look for places to stay in Glasgow. He helped me quite a lot. And I realized, wow, he actually does quite amazing science too in Edinburgh. <laughs> and um, but why not having someone from Glasgow presenting here? Uh, and to give you a brief background on um, what he does and what he did in the past. So uh, he combines um, methods in computational geosciences and does at the same time uh, uh, petrological analyses. So he, he integrates that. That's something that I was very interested uh, to see. And uh, he did his PhD with Marco, Professor Marco Herwig in Switzerland at the University of Bern, and then became um, a postdoc in Bern, and then now is a postdoc at the University of Edinburgh. So he's an early career researcher and uh, has wonderful implications to these large scale tectonics as well, starting from the microstructure. So I leave it here and maybe just a note at five o'clock tonight, um, if you want to join for an after work drink, James is there as well. So feel free to join or we'll meet at Molema at 17 hours. All right. Um, that's all from my side. Cool. Thank you, Paul. Very kind introduction. Um, one amendment, I actually did do a postdoc in there. Um, just, oh, just a PhD. I'm still very fresh. Also an academic baby. Um, yeah, okay, cool. So uh, from Chan to Paul, I realized you guys have got quite an emphasis on computational geosciences and kind of many aspects of applying kind of computation methods. That's the big direction you've been moving in for a while. So what I wanted to <clears throat> highlight was a couple of case studies. They're all uh, microstructural, but they all use kind of a mixture of sort of advanced image analysis or advanced uh, image acquisition techniques. Um, and they just at this scale already tell us quite a lot about large scale processes. So we're going to go through a, a, I'm sorry, a two, a three, and then a 4D case. And by 4D, I just mean this time result, so time result engine. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Not skipping. What? Why are you not skipping? Sorry, one second. Why is that not going suddenly? Oh, there you go. OK. Right, so the, I'm going to, within two scientific topics, kind of show you these case studies. So the first one is, why are these running? Sorry. These are supposed to be images. Let me come back here, see if it works this time. Huh. Is that not working? There we go. Okay. There we go. Now they're working. Sorry. For some reason, I was chatting for something. Okay, so the first... Uh, topic is dynamic transport properties of shear zones. Um, this is a relatively new topic. Basically, the kind of conventional thought process on shear zones and myelinetic rocks and uh, the, the rocks that make up shear zones in general is that they're tight. <clears throat> Your depths and pressures, that the lithostatic pressure is large enough that you close any porosity. Um, but there's been a model that I'll discuss in a moment that suggests that that you have this kind of dynamic permeability that evolves inside of uh, shear zones, basically. And we've got two kind of interesting sets of evidence, one in 2D and then one in 3D. This has got a couple of results buried in them. It might take me a little bit to get through. And then most recently in my postdoc, <clears throat> I've been looking at uh, the link between deformation and metamorphism in uh, in situ experiments where we run a reaction while we deform it and we image it at the same time. So there's some pretty exciting results in there. And I've tried to 
across all of this sort of mix the science and a bit of the methods so that if you wanted to use it, you could probably do it yourself with a bit of effort as a caveat in some of these cases. And most things we're doing here is all open source uh, libraries that we're using for everything. So um, kind of methods you're gonna see are essentially scanning electron microscope images, mostly for the 2D case. It's some synchrotron X-ray microtomography for the 3D case. Mostly so we have the resolution to go to very small um, kind of structures that we can image and then time resolve synchrotron microtomography for the 4D case. Um, yeah, so the dynamic transport properties. Basically the reason why we care about this is because most of the observations that we make are at this kind of small, even smaller than this. So the inside of the shear zone, you take a sample, you know, you look at a, a few grains and then you infer some kind of deformation mechanism and then you try and upscale most of this. So some of the work we started doing was trying to understand how do we look for representativeness inside of a, a you know, specific scale at this stage? And then how do we think about how can we link that up to these these kind of larger scales. So in this case, this is a shear zone from Capticreus with a decimeter kind of scale. And we know that these network all the way up to hundreds of kilometers. This is in Brazil here, in the lower crust. And we, we know that geochemical and physical implications um, of many of our observations are that shear zones must transport mass. They must be moving fluid. They must be moving partial melt. They must be moving chemistry. But we don't really have a proper picture of that. And that's where this uh, dynamic transport properties kind of comes into play. What is that? Sorry, get rid of that for you guys. Oh, there we go. <clears throat> it doesn't want to do it. It's super weird. Let's see. One second. Why is it jumping around like that? Okay, right. So, Okay, so this concept of hopefully that won't happen every two minutes. This concept of dynamic permeability or dynamic transport properties comes largely from this paper, uh, Nature paper in 2009. And the first sections of Sporting Precise in Edinburgh is in Australia at the time we worked on it. The, the general concept of this model is that inside of a shear zone, like the one we have here, the chemical processes and the mechanical processes act in Congress to open and close grain boundaries in such a way that you can flux fluids with mass through them. And this is a relatively radical idea because it changes the whole problem from diffusion dominated to advection dominated. And then it really makes the whole uh, kind of coupled response of the shears on far more complicated at depths when we would have just said it's purely business. <clears throat> so what I mean by that for people who aren't so familiar with myelinites is we take something like this, an undeformed granitic rock, we myelinitize it, and then we can end up with something like this, which is an ultramyelinite. And the easiest way to think about it is it's a textual description of a grade size production, mostly mixed with certain amounts of strain markers in there. And in the dynamic sense, that's what you're seeing. This is a, an experiment on Norcamphor, an analog to quartz. And you're seeing a shear zone uh, emerge as you displace the top boundary. So you can imagine in this kind of dynamic setting, this kind of grain scale action happening. And it's intuitive and it's pleasing to think how that might happen, but we haven't really moved forward evidencing that since it's been proposed. So the first section here, I'm gonna try and show you two sets of analysis that we did to evidence that a bit more quantitative. So that model basically presents two hypotheses. One, that porosity, symptomatic porosity, forms as a consequence of shear zone formation and the processes that act in the shear zone. And it implicitly states that essentially this has to be a meaningful bulk process or it has to affect meaningfully the bulk scale. Otherwise, we probably don't really care because it never really transfers upscale. And that's, 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 you know, that's like all good nature papers, it's proposing something big, but we need to be able to check that. So what we need to check that is a case where we know porosity is definitely a merger deformation. In a very simple case is the best case. So for example, to ditch chemistry, we need to know we've looked at something representative and we need to know that we made a meaningful link. So I turned in my PhD to some, I revisited some experiments run in Etihad by Rocky Barnhorn, 
where he took Carrara marble and he deformed it uh, through a series of shear strains until it was absolutely abused at gamma fifty. And I picked out uh, some kind of intermediate scales where you had uh, partial recrystallization and full recrystallization, so like a steady state myelinite structure. Um, these are deformed in torsion, just for clarity. And I took tangential cuts of the samples, so we had a constant strain rate that we were looking at through the sample. And I went to go look for evidence of if, as we transform this material, do we see porosity and can we quantify it? So that this is not the easiest image to see on this screen, but basically the answer is yes, we do see porosity. We see porosity at the start, which is all kind of grain boundary porosity. You see the large grains here uh, of the Carrara marble. You see the odd fluid inclusion inside of the, uh, the calcite. And then as it starts to recrystallize, we start to see domains of porosity emerge with newly precipitated, for example, pyrite taking the shape of the grains. And then eventually we start to get these structures in the steady state case that form a kind of force sheet that looks something like this. So this is something that wasn't seen before and you have to really go in looking for it and have a reason to look for it. Um, and classically, this is about where we would stop. We would say, okay, we have a picture that's about 50 microns across, across the existing shear zones. But because this is, you know, this might be consequential for why should you integrate it in a geo um, geodynamic model, for example, you really need to justify how it could upscale. So we uh, looked a little bit at a broader range broader area, sorry, and we took uh, the density, we made density maps of the porosity and we saw, okay, yeah, we do see this larger window that is still in the early stage, really grain boundary porosity surrounding like the fluid inclusion essentially, uh, surrounding the original microstructure. And then as we recrystallize, we see hints of domains. And then we eventually start to see some kind of pattern emerging in the fully uh, recrystallized steady state myelin. But again, this is just a visualization. So <clears throat> we know we have porosity, but we want to be able to look for a representative microstructure and make a meaningful link to the process. And so to start with, we took an even bigger map of an area. We varied a series of boxes, 100 boxes, 100 times, looked at statistics of that, and waited until that microstructure homogenized. And then we made the relevant maps because we now know that everything bigger than this, about 750, by 750 box size is representative for this sample and these processes. So we can make a statement that's representative about our shear zone essentially. Um, yeah, so I'm gonna try to cruise through two methods that we use to essentially statistically link the processes in the shear zone and then to quantify the structures in the shear zone at that larger scale in those kernel density maps. So we use, we turn to point statistics or spatial analysis, and this is something that we generalize to other cases. We just happen to be using porosity in this case. You could imagine mineral affinities, for example, looking for diffusion distances. And we use something that's called a ring statistic, sometimes represented as a G function or a pair correlation function. And it essentially expands this radius and it looks at the density function of the ring, and it can identify for values larger than one clustering distances or anti-clustering distances at values less than one. And you basically model a kind of null hypothesis of randomness so that you can test that. So our hypothesis in this case is essentially that as you transform this starting material into what you see at the bottom, you take a population of old grains, relic grains, recrystallize them to a smaller population, and that porosity, you want to see some systematic relationship to those processes. We do more than this as well, but I'm focusing on this for the moment. And we can use a, what's called a univariate or a bivariate analysis. So we can either consider just the porosity, the poor relationship to each other. So like, you know, are pores clustered in space? Are they anti-clustered in space? And then we can compare and look to see, this is what we want that make that causal relationship. Is the porosity emerging with these new small grains, or is it related to these older large grains and actually has nothing to do with the dynamic crystallization? So, for example, it could all be around the edge of old grains rather than the grain, the sites of the new grains. So, we ran a series of um, randomness models that define this, this kind of gray area that you can see here. So, anything that would lie in there would be random and that would have no relationship, no spatial relationship. And what we find is that the porosity has a relationship and so does the small grains and the pores. 
which means we contextualize that that pores exist at distances on average about equivalent to the recrystallized grain size. And then the center of newly recrystallized grains and pores have a relationship at about half that distance. So for a representative area, we know representatively, statistically, that we have a meaningful link in space between this emergent process and this porosity. So we can say at that point relatively confidently, James hasn't been biased and just said, I think the floors are next to all the small grains. But of course, we want to understand that larger window in the mile night. So we use uh, 2D continuous wavelength analysis. And this is quite a, looks fancy than it is. It's pretty simple if you're used to kernel analysis of any kind. This is essentially that. Uh, we take essentially a kernel of a very, which is of a very particular form, and we pass it, we convolve it all over the image, and we look for interactions. The benefit of the, the wavelet is that it's, it's discrete in space or time, depending on where you're looking, and you can vary essentially its size to filter for the size of objects and then the orientation of objects. So you can really isolate, especially very complex structures, different features. And this is also good for GIS analysis. You could run this on looking for esters or something in an outwash plane, whatever you were after. And we ran that on those kernel density maps. And what we found was we did have uh, features. So this is the partially recrystallized sample, and this is the fully recrystallized sample. And if we look at what that looks like, I haven't done the inversion here. This is just the result of the wave of analysis. You basically see in this partially recrystallized structure and in the fully recrystallized structure, we have two dominant modes that appear in both cases, and they have a certain orientation. Interestingly, the dominant mode is, or the, the larger wavelength mode in both cases is basically the same wavelength and basically the same orientation, which implies there's something fundamental about how that material is transforming and imposing the location of crystal recrystallization and core formation. So another way to say that is ultramalonites might have an intrinsic and isotropy in their, their uh, mass transport. And we can say that because we know this is all a representative samples and has statistically testable meaning in the background. Okay, yeah, so if we were to zoom in on this and we were to like I'll show you what it looks like in the rock, what you see if you zoom in on this area is you see the area that has a low density, as a low density of pores, high density of pores, low density of pores, high density of pores. So you can really localize on your microstructure exactly where you see things are happening. One of the next steps we'd like to do is look for actually for the grain size variation, because that would contradict a huge amount of work that's been done over the last 25 years by a quite a long senior professor. So you need to be very careful to make sure it's absolutely spot on before I do anything. Like so in that sense, not that we've uh, solved all the problems of dynamic transport, but I think we've made quite a lot of headway in demonstrating that it's not just a hypothesis. Because that nature paper was really a statement of intent more than anything else. Um, okay, so in that same vein, by complete chance, we imaged some rocks and we found something cool. And I'm going to show you that. And there's a lot we don't know about it. And this has maybe less in it than the last section. This is currently in review in, in geology. Um, so I'm going to take you to the Captacreus, many of you have ever been. And it's a very beautiful area. It has a network series of shear zones, which you can see marked in black, perturbing this, uh, these meta sediments. And it's a, a very large, very famous mid-crustal shear zone. And we came up here, oops, easy, into the, uh, the Cala Serena, up here, just into this bay. And we took some samples, it's a bit washed out in this image, unfortunately, just from here, just in this, an ultramilonite, just on this section of the, the network. Um, this is what it looks like. So that's you looking, so in that image you're looking uh, southeast here, so up the, the valley. And I don't know if it's so easy for you guys, but if you look, if you concentrate on this uh, quartz vein on the lower image, you can see it really being sheared out of significance. Those are huge shear strains that are there. And this is a pretty typical myelinate for the area, or ultra myelinate, as you can see on this thin section. And lots of perfiroclasts, variation in composition, pretty standard ultramarine. Um, we mapped large areas of this. Fortunately, you're going to see better images in a moment, but 
we match large ACM images of this, like this area, for example, is here. And I don't know if it's so easy for you guys, but if you look just, for example, on the shoulders of that papyrus class, you can see there's this sigma shaped pores. So we, we started noticing that there was all this porosity, like really large porosity that we thought it can't actually be real porosity. It must be polishing artifacts. Um, but it's everywhere it's through the whole sample. And we'd also seen some hints of this in some samples from the Red Bank Shear Zone in Central Australia as well. And unfortunately, only the audience online is going to see this well. That's a shame. Um, I don't know how to tell you that. Can, it, can people see anything? <laughs> yeah. Okay. So I'll, I'll try and describe this or the emerging gray thing that's coming out of you. Basically, what you should see is you should see a quartzospathic material. You're seeing essentially density variations in vertical slices through a cylindrical sample and it's moving backwards and forwards. So you're seeing the XZ section of finite strain. So the biggest, the sense of shear direction based on the maximum and minimum shortening direction. And Unfortunately, the only thing you'll probably be able to see is around these large profile clasts that are kind of emerging in and out as you image them in, in 3D are these very large 3D pores that are actually isolated. So I can sit, share this with Paul so you can show you all later if you want. Um, and we segmented that to check quantitatively. Basically what we find is that they do, they sit on these shoulders of the profile clasts tends to have a certain direction. We filtered for, for this analysis only to look at very large pores because there was some resolution issues for some of the lowest sizes that we saw. Um, and what we basically were able to determine is that the pores are cinematic and they're quite complex geometries. The, the rock right next to it, the shear zone host has none of this in it. You don't find it at all inside of there. There's only one deformation phase of which this is associated with. You can quantitatively say that the pores are isolated. And what I mean by that is the fact that this has a different color than this, for example, if I go back one, if you focus on the yellow pore, for example, that yellow pore has one color because it's uniquely isolated in space. So it's not connected, uh, at least in a voxel sense, to this pore here. But that's a bit different if you start calculating for actual percolation, but it's spatially isolated and we know that quantitatively. Um, and we find no weathering products. So you don't see retrogression biotite, you don't see any clay minerals forming. This thing is it's a, a very bizarre rock. Because if you show them for a student world that to you, you probably tell them they're lying. This is not what we ever teach. Um, interestingly, I'm not going to show that here today. But we did image this also in some ultramyelomites from the Red Bank Shear Zone. So we know in a completely arid environment, these are also appearing. So it's not salt weathering, it's not, it's not a climatic issue of the calcitrase. The nice thing about microtomography is that we can essentially quantify everything we want to because we have the 3D volumes and it's digital. So what you're looking at here is a visualization. It's a bit complicated, it's done with the axes. So of the pore volume on the y axis, with the, you can see the, the histogram for that over here. And then the class that's associated with that core volume on the long axis on the X axis. And then each data point is visualized with the orientation and aspect ratio of each class that, that, is, that the porosity is next to. Um, and then it's color coded for the position of where the core site is found on that. If you see the ones that have a, a white center, this means they're between two clasts and it's the largest class orientation and shape that's being visualized. Now, there's a lot of information in there, but if you stare at it long enough, the big thing that jumps out to you is actually the reason why you haven't concentrated so much is there's no clear relationship between anything. So there's no clear relationship between aspect ratio. You can plot this separately on a simpler diagram. You don't see any clear relationship. Uh, you don't see any clear relationship between size. It appears for all different sizes of clasts. Um, and it doesn't matter really the orientation. There's many different orientations that they appear. The main consistency is that they almost always appear with regards to the shear sense in these kind of strain shadow positions, these uh, pressure shadow positions as well. So from the microstructural analysis that we've done, we know that it must be a series of cinematic processes that are forming. It's not likely one, 
probably have some climatic dissolution material, some precipitation. You must have some mechanical behavior involved in there. But at the moment, the main thing we know pretty convincingly is that it's sinking an acid. That's it. We don't know the process. And the main thing that it points to, though, something that unfortunately you can't see so well in this, is that there's also creep cavities, these little features that I showed you in the previous section in other parts of the microstructure, and mostly in the quartz domains, the recrystallized quartz domains. And we've documented that in some previous work I've done. Um, from my master's thesis. And when you look carefully through this rock, you can actually see that, for example, here there's a quartz ribbon wrapping this fire class. And there's some, there must be some kind of communication between these very large, in the sense of an ultramyelinite porosity reservoirs, and then these uh, pre cavities that are forming. So when you start to think about these large scale systems, you have to maybe start, or we have to maybe start as a community opening up. To the possibility that despite being at mid crustal depths, there is some kind of dynamic connectivity through the scales, um, through these massive network shear zones. Now, that the reason why I say that that's important is if you think about models, for example, of melt migration, most of these models assume just a kind of static percolation and wetting based on the wetting angle of the material or melt moving. Whereas if we're expecting any shear zones involved in this, this might be a very dynamic process, for example. And it might have everything to do with the rate of deformation, uh, because creep cavities are pretty well known from material sciences. And they're, they're if you model in, in with material science uh, equations and relationships, which are not accurate for rocks, but you end up with scenarios like the slower your uh, tectonic rate or like tectonic strain rate, the more active pre cavities are. So they become more efficient, for example. So in this sense, this is something we've never really fully um, integrated. Okay, so those are results we could only got from the techniques and the computational methods. And the next section is absolutely something you can only get with these techniques and computational methods. You can't get this without X-ray transparent synchrotron X-ray migrators, tomography experiments. So we have a whole bunch of stuff that's going to be coming out soon. We have one paper in review in geology at the moment. Um, and basically what I'm going to show you right now is I'm going to break down this kit. So we took samples of gypsum for alabaster, and we uh, heated them up, confined them, squashed them, and dehydrated them. And we recorded that. Uh, through imaging, which I'll take you through, and then we analyzed the hell out of it. And this, it's the most over instrumented set of experiments I've ever worked on. And I had a question in the data. That kind of like it's ridiculous. I feel like we've made up. But, um, so, yeah, so it's over instrumented in the sense that we have axial load control through really high precision syringes. We have pore fluid pressure control. So, we also know the volume being expelled of fluids. We have confinement control uh, through the syringe. We know the axial strain uh, through a calibrated LED measurement. Um, and in this particular set of experiments, we have relatively small samples. This is in what's called Mjolnir, one of the Norse arsenal from these X-rays of transparent rigs that they've built in Edinburgh. But we've also run these experiments on much larger samples. So in this case, it's about 10 millimeters by about three millimeters. But we ran the same experiments, but we haven't analyzed them quantitatively on uh, 10 millimeter by 20 millimeter samples. So or like more in the range of like traditional deformation experiment samples. This is what it looks like. I don't know if it's so easy for you to guys to see, um, but you basically have some band heaters here sitting on the uh, lower section of the rig. You have an X-ray transparent. Um, uh, this is a titanium uh, housing here for the sample. And then we have a, another heater up here, and we have all of the controls that you can see there. To acquire the data, maybe just to briefly talk about this, uh, we have to visit a synchrotron, because you can't do this. Some of you guys have the tomography equipment here. I think you do, you have a sample, remember? Um, yeah. Soon. Not yet, soon. So <clears throat> you'll never have enough flux. You'll have to image for, you could probably image the sample through our experimental apparatus, but it would take you days and days and days to penetrate and you have too much uh not enough flux in the beam so what we do is we go to 
in this particular case to Switzerland, to the Swiss light source, to the very weird donut shaped building, which is a synchrotron light source. And essentially the way it works is, is we generate much higher energy, and much higher fluxes than what you'll get here locally in an in-house setting. And they accelerate electrons basically as part of an accelerator. Once so they get up to speed, they chuck them into the storage ring and they bend them with magnets. And what we do is we sit here at a tangent to that, to one of these magnets. As you bend the electrons, you release x-rays, very, very bright x-rays. And then we get to use those x-rays as they come off at a tangent to image our experiments. That's basically how synchrotron microtomography works. So what we do is we do Here, this is a bigger um, experiment. And essentially, the x ray passes through the sample, through the thinnest part of the sample uh, that's x ray transparent. It's a camera um, that is processed in such a way, those projections are processed such that you can reconstruct slices through the image. But now we have volumes. So that, that's the really important thing. We now have a complete digital record of everything that's happening. The problem to be aware of, which I'll go through, is that we have very large data sets, and this is a whole challenge in itself. So, <clears throat> the system, so we can set up the results a little bit properly, is gypsum dehydrating to bassanite and producing a bit of water. So, you're losing some of the water that's inside of the gypsum. And when you see that in the image, what you're seeing is gypsum in the darkest gray, bassanite here in the light gray. Porosity is the darkest phase, the black. And then the brightest phase, the white phase here, is celestite. It's a strontium bearing phase that's not participating in the reaction. So that's the marker for the reaction when we convert our volumes. These are 10 minutes apart in each scan, and you can see how the reaction is developing. You can see it emerging through the, through the experiment. And we scan this as many increments as we want, as fast as we want. Basically, we end up with too much data. We use far less of the data than we acquire. Um, and then let's talk about the two main results first, and then talk to you a little bit about the method, which you might be interested in that, because that's going to be some of the details that we want to do with the image analysis. The thing we found was that the direction and magnitude of principal stresses determine a reaction pathway. So, what I mean by that is really that the orientation of sigma one, the largest principal stress, uh, will produce reaction products orthogonal to its direction. So in this case, we had radially confined samples with sigma one. So the, we ended up with a lineation form in the vertical direction up and down the uh, sample. In the case of uh, when we applied an axial sigma one, um, what we ended up with was, in this case, it's not quite obvious here, we actually ended up with a girdle. So like a foliation developing uh, from the reaction products. And this happened at basically no strain. It's elastic. We know it's all recoverable um, and very early in the reaction. And I can say that all incredibly confidently because all the data, the data says that. That's not James guessing. Because this is a very controversial topic, the relationship between deformation and metamorphism. So I'm quite happy with this data to stand in front of the, the people that have argued the most in the worst way and say, oh, no, but our data actually shows it. It's, it's exactly in the data. There's no interpreting here. Of which step to see anything. The implication of this, which is quite large, is that is that we're not talking about irreversible strains. So we're not talking about the kind of geodynamic models we're just thinking about where so pentamine dehydrates, porosity compacts. This is not what's happening. The porosity stays open, at least at these confining pressures. Um, and this is happening for basically elastic strains. So this is a classical metamorphic reaction problem. But we are controlling the orientations and magnitudes of the principal stress. Because the cons the concept, the thing you consider in a classical metamorphic problem is really that all the stored energy, the elastic properties, the volume changes due to elasticity in the position in the crust are the things that are determining the energy available to have a reaction. So in this case, that's basically all that's happening. It's the same, it's still elastic. But if you imagine now in say a subduction zone where you are cycling through. Uh, your differential stresses. So you're you're loading the you have a plate undergoing another plate, it's loading, 
the plate, you're building up elastic stresses, you have an earthquake, you release those stresses, you're having the switching between your Antisonian stress states, you have a, a dominant sigma one horizontally, and then you release it and you go back to isotropic. These results imply you should see that in an anthropomorphic limb. And we think we do see that. So there's some work by Platon um, uh, Navata, and he finds bimodal textures of all of the uh, anisotropic textures and then non isotropic textures in a nascent subduction zone, and you can relate them to the principal stresses. So we've kind of reinterpreted that. If you want to discuss that later? I can show you that. And but we do think it has an effect in, in real tectonic settings. So to show you that it's more than just two samples, we had a few experiments. Here, if we start with BA17 and you look, you have the basinite needles. This is this one here. This is this sample here. It's radially confined. You can see the basinite needles are all poking up at you. So here we're looking in, into the X, Y plane, so down the Z axis. Um, and you can see, you can really see them all across the sample are, are all up and down. As you move towards lower differential stresses or none, you can see that the basinites have a variation or more variety of orientations. And then once you come up to say BA10 and you're now in an axially loaded system, you can really see that they now exist in that Y X plane. And we were able to confirm this also for orthogonally chord samples. So it's true regardless of the geometry of the sample that we have obtained. So it's, you're really, we can identify the difference between the inheritance from the sample and the, the imposition of the stress fields. The other thing that comes from this is that the hydrodynamics of a dehydration reaction are also controlled by that stress field. So you could imagine in this case, this, this BA17, this is this um, lineation. So that, so sorry, go in the wrong direction. So this is that sample. We now, we can, you know, you can see that the pores are around those basinites. What you end up with, if you model the permeability from that data set, because you have a digital data set, you can do this. You find that, yeah, you do have anisotropic permeability um, in the Z direction, for example. And you can also look at how that evolves. And in this case, it's congruent with the reaction products, the fluid expulsion. In the case of the, the fabric development, it's a bit more complicated because there you've got, depends on how lucky you are on how the spaghetti falls on this, because there's no reason why in this case here, the radial stress means that everything has to go up in one direction. In the axial case, they could grow in any direction orthogonal to the axial stress. Does that make sense? They can fan out in any direction. So if you get really lucky and there's some kind of pre-existing fabric in the material, you might be able to form something that's a bit more permeable. Um, Okay, but that means that there's a combination between the stress state and any irreversible compaction that will determine uniquely the hydrodynamics of the reaction. Okay, so to go over briefly, how did we get to that? How do we take this kind of image, end up with reliable boundaries of our data to produce you know, quantitative data to trust? So there's essentially three main barriers, and this is true of all data processing like this. There's the computational cost, so to give you rough, a rough insight, um, on, on Little Mjolnir, so the smaller sample I'm showing you data from, we scan about 100 to 150 times. So that's every like a few minutes we scan something. Uh, we scan three times to make a stack, to be able to look at the whole sample. And each of those is, total 30 gigabytes, so 30 gigabytes times about 100, and then you do as many samples as you run, as you can run. I would imagine you're a postdoc having to process that, or possibly a PhD student, you might scare them. And um, so you need a way to manage that. And that gets that gets worse once you get to high linear, for example, high linear is now, I mean, I had to, that I had to take, I think high linear once I stitched the data set, it was about, because that was, I think, seven stitching scans, and it's a bigger sample. I think that was something like a terabyte for one scan. I had to dive sample that because you can't use that. That's unusable. So there's a lot of things you have to consider whether you even want that much data. My answer would be don't. But anyway, that's what my boss wants. We scan everything all the time. <laughs> uh, then you've also got consistency. So how do you actually segment? Um, in this case, you both want an evolving histogram. So you're Reaction is 
what you're imaging is changing with time inside of the reaction. You have changing mean conditions, you have changing acquisition conditions, depending on the day you're there. You have uh, you know, ever so slight differences um, between beam lines as well. So this is all Swiss like source data, but if you go to diamonds, for example, in the UK, this looks different again. So how do you have consistency there? And then the biggest one, and this is kind of the holy grail that most people avoid in geosciences, is how do you have any accuracy for segmenting things? And I'm included in that, and we only recently have had a way to do this. You do your best, you try to be consistent, and that's all you could do before. But uh, Ian Butler and Edward had a brilliant idea for systems that are reacting to have an internal standard to check your accuracy. So I'll cover that. So the way we deal with computational cost and consistency is by employing deep learning. We use a, a two-stage step. This is basically what we find to be best. Um, and we basically classify, we take, we take some of our input images, so we take about 10 from just a data set. We classify it and we make sure with the random forest classification from visual inspection and a few other checks that we really end up with some really high quality segmented data that we trust. We manually correct it. We do it for only 10 slices. And then we apply it to everything. So with those 10 slices, we use that as a way to, um, to, to act as a ground truth inside of our deep learning model to check the segmentations as they um, are done inside the recording model. And this now takes about seven minutes per sample. Now I can tell you from experience, if you ask, I mean, I spent in my PhD far longer than seven minutes doing far some of those segmentation problems. We still have a cleaning stage on this, which we have to apply consistently across all the data sets to, to make sure say this celestite grains were a little bit too large to bring them down in size. So there is still a post-processing stage because the other postdoc Roberto chose not to have a pre-processing stage. We can debate whether or not that's the right thing or not. I actually think we should have a pre-processing stage personally, makes this whole thing faster, but that's a, a choice that we made. And, but that gives us consistency because we can apply this across all our data sets. So when we report, or try to understand how good a job our segmentation did, it's really the same process. It's not thresholds that change because you had a slightly different acquisition moment. Um, it's not, uh, yeah, I mean, basically it's very consistent. I can't kind of fun oversell that enough. If you have a chance to play around with deep learning and you're using problems like this and you have data sets that are big enough to justify it, it's a total game changer. We can just now give this to the new PhD student in this fund and they can process everything again. We have a workflow where the change reaction, they can spend maybe a month or so refining this step again for the new system and they can use it for everything. So it's definitely time well spent. Now, for the accuracy case, for those that maybe don't get why it might be critical, I might I'll just step through an example to show you why it's important when you want to quantitate with these types of systems. We generated some fake porosity, so some random points. We resample them to give them a bit more resolution and then blur them to give them some edges. And we were to threshold those with, say, three thresholds that you would all, all of us would convincingly argue why our threshold is reasonable. Those are all reasonable thresholds. If you try and take that and you try and get, say, a porosity value, which we know should be 20%, you can have a doubling depending on what you chose for very reasonable uh, segmentation thresholds. So it basically means anything that's not an order of magnitude difference is the same value. Regardless of what anyone tries to convince me in their paper, I don't mind if they publish it, but it's the same value. It's not, you, you might wanna know the difference between 0 0.1, you know, 0 0.5, for example, but in all honesty, you don't know it unless you have a way to check the accuracy. And we're all in the same boat with that because I segment porosity regularly and I have to talk about relative changes because I don't know if they're real changes. No, it's what I looked at. So Ian Butler's idea, which I encourage you all to think about using if you have react, like a system of reaction that you know are happening, is you use the chemistry as an internal standard for what you expect to be there. So in our case, we know we should have gypsum inside our volume. 
and we know it should transform to fast night plus water. So in this case, we ignore the water for the moment. We should transform to fast night and have a solid volume reduction that we can calculate. So that's what this is here. This is the vaseline, this is the salt, the porosity, and this is the gypsum increase. And because you know that and you know the volume, this is going to be useful because you guys have a speed system that's been set up. You could scan a metamorphic rock. You don't need a time series. And if you've identified your reactions, you can plot something like this, a kind of classical reaction progress type diagram. And you can look to test if you did a good job of segmenting your data. Because realistically, your reactants and your products should lie very close to that line. So in our case, we can say that all the data lies within 5% of the true value, which is pretty good because it means we can trust it. And it's, it's not so much good because we think we're very clever, it should mean we can trust it. I can confidently go to a conference in each of you and say we see effective deformation and metamorphism and know that no matter what I'm waiting someone gets because they don't like what it says to their theory, I, I trust my data. This isn't a guess. This is very, very trustworthy. Which means that when I expand that diagram, if we look at this data, we can really say that from very early on in the reaction, because we know the microstructure at every given point, so this is whole figures looking down at the egg axis, we can really quantitatively at each step interrogate what's happening. So we know this is emerging as soon as the reaction starts at strains of like. 0 0.007 uh, strain, axial strain. But it's, it's really happening. It's, it's not it's not core collapse either, because we know the amount of porosity we have. We know we have it right until the end of the reaction. So um, the take home messages are, from a science point of view, that shear zones have dynamic transport properties. I hope you convinced you that, at least in the experiments I looked at, they are convincingly there and associated with the process. And the differential stress not strain itself can form metamorphic networks. Um, and that basically everything I presented today is entirely the product of that kind of computation step. We could, I mean, I could have made an argument, a convincing argument, but the porosity is locally associated with fine grains, for example. But ultimately, if we want to take very provocative models like the dynamic granular fluid pump and know if it means anything in, say, a geodynamic model or or I guess just anything means anything other than a guess, you kind of have to make this step. The next step ideally would be to take, say for example, the capital grace, you start looking for what is a representative piece of shear zone in nature, and then try and analyze that and try and really step through it, know what's a representative microstructure and understand that kind of representativeness through scales so that when we take natural data, and you try and link it to upscaling in the modeling setting, you can actually have a proper true comparison. Because at the moment, we just mostly guess at that jump between scales. It's mostly, it's mostly a visual guess. We don't actually have quantitative data to see separation. But I hope that you see that I think quantitative image analysis really lets you kind of make that step. And I think that's everything. <laughs> A lot of things for this really great talk and example on how you start from a classic theological question and actually statistically scrutinize the S out of it and use uh, state of the art methods. So, any questions? Uh, thank you very much for your uh, insights and informative presentation. I really like this. I have a question. So, usually, when you, as you mentioned, when you uh, when you try to make like advanced image change like spectron or high high resolution, then you you end up having a huge data set, mm -hmm. right? Uh, big volume. But the problem is, like, is there a way to make sure that the sample that you study is presented to the actual sheet, for example, or the actual nature? Because mm -hmm. you, you due to to the constraint. That uh, constraints that have been mentioned, we have to get some type of small samples. Mm -hmm. So, how can we extrapolate the information that we get from analyzing a small sample to a, a large feature or, or a large sheet, for example? Mm -hmm. So, no, it's, it's, a, it's, it's the question. It's a great question. It's the question. So, there's one paper by one researcher that's trying to answer this, in my opinion, Michael Crystal Schramm. 
he made an attempt, I think, in his master's thesis to try and look at the kind of discrete scales that you see and, and like what would be a representative size of, of each scale, of structure of each scale. And the answer is the only way you could really do that for nature properly is just make the calculations. So in my case, I was mostly testing the question. So for example, in the first part of, you know, do these features emerge with process mostly? So take the simplest case, mostly homogeneous material, chemically mostly homogeneous, put it through a deformation that we know it has to transform, it has to produce the processes I want to see, and then work. Um, whether or not that's something you see through, say, for example, uh, you know, a pure quartz myelinite in the, you know, the red up fault in the Alps, you really, in, in my opinion, the, the next step in, in that kind of microanalysis is don't just take your favorite sample. You actually have to go there and you have to say, okay, how do I map maybe say from the GIS scale down to know like what's the right field area to investigate? Maybe I need a Maybe I only need a five by five meter field area because I've identified the variations or such that it's that's about the right scale for that scale transition and then work your way down. So in my opinion, the only way we'll actually know it is by calculating. I, I think we're too biased. Like all of us have our preferences. We're, in fact, I, I think we're in a really good way trained to be biased because we're trained to see the differences. So I tend to walk straight to the heterogeneity that I find most interesting. I don't walk up to the homogeneous sandstone and be, or maybe I'm not an oil geologist, but like I don't see that and think, oh yeah, I'm like, I avoid it. I go straight to the content. So I think you'd have to calculate it. You'd have to overcome. I mean, when I showed this data to my supervisors, for example, that scale, which is the one scale, they didn't know why I was looking at it. They couldn't see anything and you said it, but they gave me a lot of latitude. And when I got out on one supervisor, it's just outside of it. Why are you looking at just calcite? So I like in that sense, only really the statistics that were able to convince me because there's checks inside of that as well of where you see this be relevant and on them. And um, you'd have to calculate is basically answer. And you'd have to have a good way of managing your data and reducing the problem to always the right amount of area to look at each like zoom in of the problem in, in my opinion. At least the can I ask kind of a follow-up question to that? As a not especially computation person, yeah. but the, you know, would you use 2D data sets, you know, like the kind of scan and trace on that you showed? How is there like a, a method, a published method or a workflow or something that I can follow to make those calculations? Uh to make like a kind of an RV. Do it separate things for this. Uh I mean, I think I left, I think I actually put code into my own paper. So you okay. can try and replicate yeah. that. I mean, it's basically in that case, I was just using a cube that we're producing. Yeah. But I mean, let's say you have a shear zone, and it's obviously inherently anisotropic, it's a big like wide long thing. You know, you might have to there portray in the way you calculate that to like either to handle the edge effects a certain way or generate boxes randomly on say the central axis to make it wider than, than the shear zone and just expand them for that um, isotropy. So there's an assumption there that it's, it's just a calculation of saying if I it could be anything or that porosity it could be the average base scale value. Mm -hmm. uh, I mean that's the beauty of just acknowledging the limitation of computational data. If say I went to cap to praise, I could just take every variable like photogrammetry, and even if it's a bad resolution, I could start by saying what is the minimum field area that I need to see to see the like, maximum for the all the variation in the area. So uh, no one's really done that yet, but I, I actually think that's the everyone wants to pay attention to the upscaling in the modeling sense. But at that point, and I like modeling, I use models, but that's you models whatever you want to be to me. Like I mean at that point you've not kind of linked it to I feel like we have a lot of work to take our actual observational data and make that uh quantitative enough to make statements about what's actually representative. But I can talk, I mean it's pretty it's pretty easy. I mean it's it's not it's easy in the sense you just have to write some code to make a box expand and calculate something instead of the box. I mean, kind of get into the scale of the computational problem, like terrible data sets, but um, 
in terms of like deep learning and, and, and training and classification model, like something you mentioned before you explained that was around like the changing environmental conditions during the scan, like changing the conditions and things like that. So are you having to develop a new training data set for every scan to reflect that change, those changing environmental conditions? Yeah. 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 It's very effective. It seems to work pretty really well. The main reason why I think it works well is is uh, I don't know if it's very easy to see with this, but um, oh, is that not going? Why is that not? It's just very slow to get there. Changing? Oh yeah, because that's the the next slide. Oops, sorry. Yeah. So the the big step that happens with this classification input is you're moving really from just you know a gradient or like you know essentially a gradient field into something that has discrete domains so you start to give information about like orientation size geometry this kind of thing so the, the deep learning basically doesn't really mind too much the ratio variation is, is different but there's a pretty good job of saying i have more information so i can use that information so in, in that regard that extra step solves a lot of problems because maybe to say it the other way without that step all of the segmentation is bad we spent roberta spent a long time trying to choose the different architectures and then the different kind of uh, models he was using so like uh, whether he was using data augmentation for example so taking basically what that means is you would take let's say you just took the grayscale images and input you would use the computer's kind of guessing capacity to generate new versions of data, try to learn from that. So like it's kind of expanding, it's, it's training data set, but it still did a bad job because it didn't know very much in the grayscale. Whereas for this case, with data augmentation, augmentation they're very fast, very reliable. So um, yeah, so in, in, in that sense, it's surprising maybe, but the computers are very good as long as you give them the right start. So, yeah, it took Roberto a year to figure that out. There was a lot of drag, we used Dragonfly for this and, and for the, the 3D kind of volume stuff. And they basically just published the functions and the, the classifier models and didn't get any help about it because I guess they were just like go easy. So, Roberto basically made a user file essentially by having to go through every model to check out the forms. Um, so, if you're interested in that, I can give you his details because it's Definitely worth learning from other people rather than spending the time. Yeah, just I mean, turning knobs. No, I, I mean, I'm thinking about completely different application classifying land use and satellite imagery. Mm. Uh, like that was to make finding where vegetation starts at the coast as an indicator of coastal change. Mm -hmm. So, I like think it's less uh, less well and deep learning. So, mm -hmm. I don't quite think that's useful. Yeah, we're probably you know, having to. Change training data sets based on time of year or so, sure, yeah. Not to make changes like this, but yeah, no, I just echo yeah, that one. Though. There's a lot of opportunities to learn from each other, trying to do yeah. very different things at the same time. I mean, I would, to see. I would try classifying in. I mean, have you tried putting classifiers as inputs? Uh, so, like, classify data, sorry, as inputs. Yeah, yeah, I've tried it yeah. and it didn't work. No, I'm not saying it didn't work. I didn't, didn't actually answer that. Ah, oh, okay. But this is working for us. But yeah, because I imagine it might help because, you know, like, the computer gets a bit upset if something was brown and now it's green. Like in that, in that sense, like in this case, the slight variation in red scale, we just kept on picking the wrong thing. And we did a very bad job. Yeah. Before we I mean, we, we're using kind of manually classified training data sets. So oh, you are? Yeah. 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 The thing that like the change in environmental conditions is what I need to do when you train the training data sets to reflect the perfection. So, what are you using? Is it a supervised or unsupervised? Is it like, right? So, this is this is a unit architecture, which is essentially a new, like an unsupervised neural network. Yeah. You're not using that to refer to what you're using. Oh, that's like a supervised. Yeah, yeah. Some of the stuff I use was like supervised stuff where I was manually classifying the library to figure it out. Yeah. But that was very, very, very you know, one of that will change every time. So like the um maybe maybe of course yeah we use the method for that. So they don't have maybe use the one last question. Yeah, that's one. Well, it's just like disappointing because they don't want to replace that. Hey, 
Um, but they haven't been following the discussion about food and smell. So it was interesting when you said so there are still discussions on society in that way. So, uh, um, yeah, basically, it was a driving mechanism of those who are hospital. I know that in uh, Florida, in 2009, they have a supporting this driving off law. But going on to the sightings, it opens the doors and supply of food yeah. companies and all systems. Yeah. Uh, I wonder uh, what are the well, uh, what is the consensus on that? Well, which mechanisms? So that where? Uh, uh, yeah, definitely. So we were able to show that the media, the analysis of the media is probably rotating through some kind of hostile environment driving. Um, there's been some work by Jack Presser, we were hinting at some other kind of coordination mechanisms. And I guess maybe more generally, I was trying to say that. We essentially previously have adopted and said you can't form those things because of the conditions. But the more anyone seems to look, the more we seem to find information about it. So, in the case, yeah, so the conventional argument would be so, for example, when I looked at these experiments, I had, I, do you know, uh, Phil Skinner, for example, I uh, used an experiment here in America. So he basically, every time we ever had any conversations, he was always like, yeah, what's your conditions? There's nothing open. And then, okay, maybe they're open in your experiment, but you raise the confinement pressure, but they just, like, they won't stay open. But the core geometry uh, should be such that it's very small and you're not going to have enough of a dynamic communication between anything. But that's almost ideological rather than checking <laughs> was my issue with that. So um, I would say that there's more consensus towards people agreeing these things exist but i would argue if you have a rock that for example i don't it's not something that can be very easily seen on this slide i guess you go back a little bit you know but if you have a rock that for example has i'll just bring that out because it's the easiest thing to see that has some kind of symptomatic porosity that can form as large as, as these volumes you know almost in some cases almost the size of a fiberglass and in some cases, crazy long geometries that are probably dynamic. They show evidence of, uh, of relationships to grain rotations. In the same rock, that shows evidence for small creek cavities. This thing is not a classical viscous problem. This, this is a, a, a you know a hydrochemical mechanical problem. This is a this is a, a much more complicated problem than just saying in a geodynamic model, for example, our shear zones are are just honey. Because if you take that combined with the other results um, at the end of the lecture, where you have this relationship between stress and reaction, all of a sudden, I mean, the shear zones are going to be a very different thing than what you put into most computational models. So maybe all I was trying to hint at with this was more that I think we don't have a proper framework to discuss dynamic um, core forming for me, dynamic core for me, or dynamic permeability, let's say that way, and the transport properties in reacting and forming rocks, because that's not considered properly in, say, pseudo sections. Because it would be a horrible thing to calculate. You have a essentially a dynamically fluxing system in which the rate of material loss is governed by the rate of dissipation from mechanical processes and not chemical processes. Your Gibbs free energy surfaces mean nothing. You've used half your energy on other things. So, in that sense, it's much bigger than like one talk that fixes it. But that's, I would argue, by reconsidering how shear zone rocks look and the relationship between reaction and deformation, you probably have to reconsider a lot more about how we make assumptions. Maybe is what I'm trying to say. Not an agreed, but not an agreed framework. Well, uh, thank you very much. And thank you for coming. Um, James is around. Uh, uh, five so um for a point and um in the afternoon as well if you want to meet him one-on-one -on -one, let me know um otherwise yeah thank you for coming everyone cool thanks everyone stop sharing my screen i guess